and then I'll spotlight. I'll spotlight. Oh, oops. Okay, I only see you. That's good, right? I think so. Yeah. Okay, it'll probably have like you and I on the side, right? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so welcome everybody. We are going to be talking today about proteins. So we're just going to be talking about the basics, going over vocabulary. It's going to be things from like the structure of proteins, how they fold, um, the function of different proteins, or lots of different types. And then we're going to talk a little bit about protein evolution as well and versus like conserved regions of proteins and kind of how, how we have such a wide variety of proteins to begin with. Um, so thank you for coming. To start, um, intro question is, what are proteins? So proteins are just broadly, they're polypeptide chains. Um, so that means that they're just chains of amino acids. And we'll get into what amino acids are later and what their properties and the different kinds. But um, yeah, broadly, they're just these chains of amino acids. They fold up in random shapes. Well, not random. Um, they fold up into these really complex figures, like what you see on the right. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to take you right now through some of the different functions of proteins. So um, there are enzymatic proteins, which are just enzymes, and these are proteins that catalyze chemical reactions in cells. So they, they'll catalyze, you know, metabolic processes or metabolic pathways, or they'll catalyze digestion. So an example is like di digestive enzymes. Um, you can have structural proteins, so these might live in like the the cell membrane where they give support to the cell membrane or they give support to the cytoplasm of the cell. You can have storage proteins which uh, just like store amino acids for use later on to be like broken down. You have transport proteins which move things around in the cell, hormonal proteins like insulin. So there's like a wide variety of protein functions and the, the functions are dictated by the structure and what they can do and the, the specific domains that they have. So you might have a receptor protein and what characterizes that as a receptor protein is the, like if it has a, a domain on the side, like as a receptor. So, you know, if it didn't have that structure, then it couldn't act as, as a receptor. So the, the structure and the function of proteins are, are linked very closely together. Um, so I'm gonna start with just an overview of broad, broadly of, of genetics inside of the cell and how proteins are made. So this is called the central dogma of biology. And if you took biology, at some point during your high school careers, then you will know about the central dogma. Um, it's really important inside of cells. It basically describes the information flow from DNA all the way to proteins. So um, you, you have DNA, and this is like double-stranded DNA, which you can see here. And this is written in the language of you know, A, T, C, and G. These are the DNA bases. And then the DNA is transcribed into RNA, and so the language here is uh, AUCG, so these are the RNA bases. They're the exact same as the DNA ones, except for um, the T is now switched to a U. So then you have this single-stranded RNA, and this RNA is then translated into a protein with amino acids, and these are the, the single letter codes here for all 20 amino acids that can make up proteins. So this is just a broader review of kind of the um, the information flow in general, but I'm going to go into the details right now. Um, so here we have transcription, and transcription is the process of DNA to RNA. And so what happens here is you have a gene. So this is a gene that encodes for a certain protein uh, that you want to translate, end up translating. But you can't go directly from DNA to a protein. You have to have this middleman as an RNA, um, mainly because DNA is uh, usually like localized separately from the ribosomes, which are like what synthesizes the proteins. So you have to have this like middleman RNA to like give the message, to transcribe the message and then give it to the protein, like to the ribosomes to be translated. So you have the, you have this double-stranded DNA, splits open. Um, there's this promoter region and a lot of factors that go into actually promoting this. And you have this RNA polymerase, which is an enzyme. It, this is actually a protein in itself that is got from this process of DNA RNA protein translation 
RNA is a protein, uh, RNA polymerase, and RNA polymerase basically transcribes this DNA into RNA. And the way it does that is it translates from the DNA language, which is ATCG, into RNA. So if you have an A in like on the DNA side, that uh, is transcribed into a U in RNA, and then a T is transcribed into A, C, G, and G and C. And so then at the end of this process, you just have this single-stranded RNA. So then that, that single-stranded mRNA is then uh, put into the ribosome here, which is in the cytoplasm. So this is just kind of floating around in the cell. You have a lot of these complexes um, floating around, and the mRNA is then bound to it. And so then you have, um, instead of translating from simple language of DNA to RNA, where it's like one-to-one -one ratio, you have this process where um, you, you can't go from uh, you know, you can't go from just a U to a certain amino acid because there, there are 20 different amino acids you have to encode for. So you need to have multiple different um, like ways to code for 20 different amino acids from only four different letters, right? And so the way that this is done is with um, this language. So it's done in pairs of three. So if you have um, like nine different base, bases on an mRNA strand, that is encoding for three different amino acids. So you have the first group of three is going to code for something, let's say that this is uh, CCU, that's going to encode for proline as an amino acid. And then maybe the next um, three bases on the mRNA are AAU, and that would encode here for asparagine. And so you're going to have, instead of just like a one-to-one -one ratio, like you would have with DNA, you're going to have three RNA, like three mRNA bases is going to code for, for one of the um, one of these peptides or one of these amino acids, and so you can see that here it's done with it's done with tRNA. So you have this strand here; it's UGG, right, or AAA, and so AAA is going to encode for lysine, the amino acid, and GAU is going to encode for asparagine. And so this is like the translation from um, mRNA into um, your polypeptide chain. So yeah, that that. These two processes are what describes the flow of genetic information, DNA, RNA to protein. So I hope that was a good overview. Yeah, and we can check in here. Um, I sent a few messages in the chat, but if you have any questions, comments, you don't understand, anything you want to ask for further clarification for, please send a message in the chat. Um, you know, if you have a question, someone else probably has it too. And the point of this really is to make sure that uh, everyone is on the same page when it comes to, you know, the basic bio information that we're going to be relying on throughout this program. Uh, so I'll pause again and ask if anyone has any further questions. Um, and if so, once again, either feel free to just uh, send a message in the chat and we'll do our best to kind of address it. Um, so yeah, any questions at this time about water proteins, uh, transcription, translation, and those first few steps in how you get from a piece of DNA to an actual protein that can do something. Uh, if not, then I guess we can move on to the next part. And as always, again, feel free to ask a question at any point. We'll be monitoring the chat. <clears throat> okay. So Sarah just walked you guys through how you get from a random sequence in DNA somewhere to an actual collection of uh, a peptide. Uh, peptide in this case just means amino acids that are put together, uh, polypeptides. Oh, okay, we have a question. What is transcription? Okay, okay. So if we go back to... Um, so there's two processes that result in getting that polypeptide right. The first part of it is transcription. So transcription is DNA to RNA. Then translation, the next slide, uh, is from RNA to a polypeptide chain. That just means a bunch of amino acids put together. So a, um, you'll have a RNA polymerase that will do transcription. It'll read the DNA and it will turn it into RNA. And then you'll have a ribosome that will do the translation. So those are the two steps that break down uh, how the process kind of moves forward. So remember, transcription is from DNA to RNA, and translation is from RNA to amino acid, a polypeptide chain. Uh, 
in biology, there's a lot of terms that are kind of used over and over again, and sometimes they mean the same thing. So polypeptide, amino acid, uh, protein, um, we'll talk about residues later. All of these mean the same thing, that chain of amino acids that are being put together that eventually form a fully folded protein. Any other questions? And thanks, Ashley, for asking. All right, okay. So primary structure. So we just talked about how you get to a bunch of polypeptides, you know, a bunch of amino acids put together. Uh, the next question is though, okay, I have this long chain, but how does it actually do anything? And the answer is it can't, not in its initial long chain form. That long chain that comes out of the ribosome, that initial form is called the primary structure. That's literally just a bunch of these amino acids put together into a long line, right? Um, this is called the primary structure because it's the first form that these polypeptides take, but over time they fold together to form those complex proteins. But it starts off as just the sequence of amino acids that are chained together. And that's a picture illustrating that. So now you start with a primary structure and then the uh, next process that really starts to happen is protein folding. Um, and protein folding is a really cool and complicated thing that honestly no one completely understands, right? It's still insanely crazy how any of this works. And it not just works, but it works so well that like millions of these reactions are happening inside you right now, happening inside all of us. But protein folding means you start with this sequence, and this sequence over a very short period of time will come together and assemble into a fully folded structure. And the reason that it's coming together is it's trying to find its lowest energy state. So when a protein is just a long sequence, you know, it's doing okay, but it could be doing a lot better if it formed into a much closely well put together, very low energy state. You can think of this like chemistry, right? Things don't like to be in their high energy states. They want to be in their low energy states. And with proteins, they've evolved over, again, you know, millions and billions of years to where their lowest energy states are in these really complicated patterns, these really complicated uh, structures that help them do what they need to do. There's a class of proteins called chaperones that actually help proteins fold. So protein folding doesn't necessarily just happen, you know, uh, just as soon as the protein is done being made by the ribosome, as soon as that primary structure is complete, it can play, take place while the primary structure is being added to, or it can take place inside a separate chaperone environment. Uh, it all depends on the specific protein, but the general concept is that as that sequence you know, is assembled, as that long primary sequence is assembled, that protein begins to fold, and it begins to try and find that lowest energy state where it's fully folded into the right shape. So, the way that this uh, folding kind of works, it actually has to do with the amino acids that make up that protein themselves. So amino acids are called, called amino acids because they all have the same very basic shape. And if you look here, you'll see that all of these amino acids, they have uh, an amino group as well as a carboxyl group. The carboxyl group is the one with the C and the double O bond on that side. And the amino group is the NH3 on the other side. So these two groups are why we call these things amino acids. Now these are the 20 natural amino acids. All that means are these are the 20 amino acids that we see being used for the most part to make all of the proteins that life uses. There are amino, other amino acids, because again, all it takes to make an amino acid is you need to have a carboxyl and a amino group. Those are just the words for those like, you know, groups of uh, molecules right there. And you can add anything else and it'll still be an amino acid. These are just the 20 natural ones that exist um, within organisms. And they all have different properties. So you'll see here that the, in this diagram, they've been divided into four of the major properties, which are nonpolar, positively charged, negatively charged, and polar. To break down what that means, if you guys remember from chemistry, and also feel free to ask questions if this isn't super clear, um, but molecules can have different charges, right? And they can have different distributions of charges. And these distributions of charges impact how they interact with each other. If something is nonpolar, it means that its charges are spread out very evenly. No part of the protein is particularly positive or particularly negative. Uh, it's mostly just chill. Then you have positively charged uh, amino acids, which have a positively charged ion on them. That means that they're not electrostatically balanced. That means that they have like, you know, a space where an electron could go. 
That means that they're going to repel other positive charges. And that means that they're generally going to interact uh, in a lot of other different kinds of chemistry that nonpolar compounds can't do. And those are the three typically uh, positively charged amino acids. Then you'll have negatively charged amino acids, which is similar to the positively charged amino acids in that they don't have balance of charges. They're really, you know, they have that extra electron somewhere that's giving them that negative charge and they'll interact very closely with positively charged amino acids. You know, they'll be attracted and they'll repel each other. Uh, and they'll also be able to do lots of chemistry, specifically like acid-base chemistry stuff that nonpolar and polar can't really do as much. Finally, you have polar uh, amino acids and polar amino acids, you know, they don't have uh, extra positive or an extra negative charge anywhere, but they still have a fully equal distribution of charges. Think of things like water, for example. You know, water can do hydrogen bonding because it doesn't have an equal distribution of charges. These polar proteins typically also have either a uh, hydroxyl group or, a or an oxygen group that, you know, doesn't have a perfect distribution of charges. And that's why they'll tend to also, you know, do things that nonpolar uh, amino acids can. All of these broadly also break down into two groups of hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Hydrophobic means it hates water. Uh, which, you know, isn't necessarily true, you know, right? Proteins don't really, or amino acids can't really hate or love water. But what this means is more that it can't uh, form hydrogen bonds or it prefers to actively distance itself from hydrogen bonds. Because when you put something that's not charged next to something that's really charged or it has, you know, something that doesn't really like hydrogen bonds or something that really likes hydrogen bonds, uh, thermodynamically, that's not their lowest energy state they would much prefer to be with other things that are like them rather than be next to things that are very different. Uh, different in the sense of, uh, you know, being able to form hydrogen bonds. So the nonpolar proteins are hydrophobic and they'll typically prefer to be in situations where they, are, where they are away from water because they can't make hydrogen bonds. Whereas the hydrophilic proteins, which are typically gonna be uh, the, uh, the hydrophilic uh, amino acids, sorry, are typically going to prefer to be in areas where they can interact with water. So nonpolar amino acids will typically try and fold inwards, and um, the hydrophilic amino acids will typically try and fold outwards to be in contact with water. So that's one of the ways that this uh, folding process kind of gets driven. So now that we talked a little bit about folding, there's several layers to folding as well. Oh, well. Uh, the first is kind of secondary structure and secondary structure really means like there's two basic uh, types of structure and these are kind of defined by the backbone amino acids themselves. There's alpha helices and beta sheets. So alpha helices just mean those swirls that we see on that diagram and the beta sheets are again just like these long strips um, and they're maintained by hydrogen bonding. Uh, so they're one example, and these are like kind of the easiest to kind of determine because there's a pretty regular pattern that you can determine pretty quickly just by looking at the sequence that tells you whether it's going to form alpha helices or beta sheets. Yeah, then there's also, after the secondary structure, you have tertiary, tertiary structure. And it's important to note that all of these structures are kind of like built on top of each other. So the tertiary structure is in a way uh, defined by the primary structure and the secondary structure in front of that. Um, because the way that like the tertiary structure is folding, you can only fold certain ways based on how, like if you have an alpha helices here and a beta sheet there, you can only fold in a certain, a, a certain configuration. So like the amino acid sequence is not just driving the, the secondary structure, it's driving how the, how the protein folds from a three dimensional level. And so like the tertiary structure is, is kind of like the completed protein uh, three-dimensional like protein structure. So after it goes through that process that we saw that uh, that little video on the protein folding thing, it's going to be um, in this structure that is thermo like the most thermodynamically stable, and that is called like the, ter the tertiary structure. So you'll have um, a mixture of all the secondary ones. So alpha helices and beta sh uh, beta sheets are the most common, and you know you can see these here. There's also other ones like you have like these loops and turns uh, as well that connect the, the beta sheets and the, and the alpha helices. And then also this includes um, bound molecules inside of the structures. So um, some proteins, mainly all proteins actually, um, have active sites and have binding sites for other molecules. 
And so these yellow structures here are not necessarily, they're, they're not part of the um, amino acid sequence, they're not part of the actual protein itself, but they are part of the tertiary structure because the way that the protein is configured is such that it, uh, it binds directly to these molecules and it, it becomes a part of the tertiary structure. So in some cases, um, in order for the protein to function correctly, it has to have these molecules bound or um, you know, by binding it, it will make it so that it's not no longer bound. So um, yeah, that, 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 that's another component of this tertiary structure and it's like final three dimensional structure. And then on top of the tertiary structure, you have this thing called the quaternary structure. And this is essentially um, just a bunch of proteins, a bunch of polypeptide chains that have their own independent tertiary structure and you're combining them together into a protein complex. So it's less of a protein in itself and more of um, a combination of protein uh, polypeptide chains together um, that create this like larger and more complex protein. So uh, an example of this is the um, this tetramer of human hemoglobin. So it has these four different subunits of, of heme groups, which have different tertiary, tertiary structures on their own. But then when they come together into this complex, this is when they're active. They, they're not active on their own, but when they come together, then, then they can actually do their, their job that, they, that they're normally going to be doing. Um, and that comes when they actually bind together into this quaternary structure. So yeah, so for a summary, you have the primary structure and the primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. Um, so glycine, leucine, uh, asparagine, just, just the sequence um, coming together. Like that's, that's what's coming out of translation. It's what's coming out of the ribosome during translation. Then right after that, it starts to form these secondary structures that you'll see. And the secondary structures are just these small portions. And it's like the pattern within a small portion of the protein. So the alpha helices and the beta sheets. And tertiary structures is the entire three-dimensional shape of the protein that is made up of many of the secondary structures. So you have the alpha helices, you have beta pleated sheets. And then the quaternary structure is a combination of multiple tertiary structures from multiple different polypeptide chains. So do we have questions on any of that so far yeah. before we move on to the next section? And I usually, I can't see the chat, so you should yep. not have the chat pulled up. Any questions on any of that, how we get from that sequence to that final folded protein? Um, any questions about protein folding itself, any of those steps in the protein folding process? wait a little bit more feel free to ask questions if you want more details even too or anything like that on any of the specific parts of this process all right okay um, if there are any questions, we'll address them as they come up, but then I guess we can move on to the next part of this, which is protein evolution. Okay, so at this point, I firmly expect that, you know, you guys have probably, to some extent, heard about evolution before. Uh, you know, the whole Darwin thing, survival of the fittest, uh, giraffes, I don't know, what else, what else is used for evolution? Coronavirus? Uh, that's going to be pretty fun, right? I guess in the future, they're going to use, like, COVID to explain evolution, maybe? That'd be pretty funny. Um, but yeah, evolution. So you guys have probably all heard of evolution and understand, you know, it's a process by which due to random mutation and uh, natural selection, organisms over time evolved to be better adapted to their environments. Well, where does evolution actually happen? Like at what level does it actually happen? And the answer is that while a selection happens at the level of the organism, right? Like because it's whatever organism is better able to reproduce, the actual evolution aspect, the adaptation, actually happen at the protein level. So here on this, in this picture, for example, we have a picture of a, a globulin protein, right? Um, oh, yeah, Michelle. The different ways that a sequence of amino acids can fold, or is there typically one shape? Okay, yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, if you go back one slide. 
Oh, wrong. Yeah, wrong way. <laughs> um, okay, so Michelle asked, are there different ways that a sequence of amino acids can fold, or is there typically only one, only one shape? And the answer is that, in fact, uh, there's a lot of proteins that can fold many different ways, and there's also some proteins that actually have no particular shape. These are called irregular proteins or you know, disordered proteins. Uh, but the general idea is proteins typically will have several shapes that they can fold into. For example, like an activated shape, an inactive shape. Uh, a, sometimes if like other molecules bind, they'll have like a, enhanced shapes or um, shapes that are worse at doing the job that they need to do. Uh, so there's typically several different structures that they can fold into. And they normally just settle into whatever is the most thermodynamically convenient at that particular time. So a typical protein will have, and that's actually one of the biggest uh, issues with the state of our understanding of protein folding right now, is we've been, we've really struggled so far, like scientists have really struggled so far to really understand even the most basic ways that a protein can fold. So for most proteins, we only have one or two uh, shapes available of exactly how they fold. And while we know that they fold differently with, when like things like, let's say you have an enzyme, when an enzyme binds to its substrate, the thing that it's like helping catalyze, the thing that it's helping react, um, it's going to change its shape. But normally when we like analyze these proteins or we study the way they are shaped and we like figure out how they're shaped, we only do it in a few different forms. So we might only know what it looks like without that, you know, substrate inside it. And we might only know how it looks like, or maybe we only know how it looks like with the substrate bound. Um, so that is a problem in the field. Yes, there are lots of different ways that typically proteins can fold. Some proteins are better than others in that they typically fold one way most of the time. Um, but yeah, that is a good question. There's also certain regions, sorry, I'm just gonna add on a little bit, but there are certain regions in the protein that are more disordered than others as well. Like, uh, I think they're called intrinsically disordered regions of proteins yeah. where those like those regions don't really matter as much to the structure and so they can they tend to just be all over the place but there are other parts of like specific proteins or sequences that can only fold into a specific um like formation or they just won't function properly yep and we'll talk about that with conservation as well uh, uh when we cover more of the protein evolution stuff but great question um so speaking of that uh and connecting it back to kind of uh the situation with uh, protein evolution. Here we have a picture of a bunch of globulin uh, proteins and, oh yeah, uh, as they've evolved over time. So you can see here that there's like a phylogenetic tree. And the reason that this happens is because again, when things mutate, when we say that, you know, uh, organisms like have mutations or species accrue mutations over time, what's actually mutating is the DNA. And when that DNA mutates, typically the thing that it impacts is either going to be the protein directly or the expression of a protein, like when that protein gets turned on or off. So this is a tree that shows the mutations that are different uh, with the red area being like a, a key active region and the white areas being regions that are more distinct, uh, less conserved uh, between the different like uh, proteins of these globulins. So connected to like blood proteins, for example, like, um, like hemoglobin. And we see that humans share are relatively close to you know sperm whales and horses, but actually really really far away from tuna. Yet there's some parts of the proteins that are same across all of these organisms. So that's kind of crazy to think of how much of that protein stays the same, and yet how much of it can also be very very different. Um, even with things that you would say are probably closer together, uh, there's also a pretty good amount of differences. So that's an example of like that conservation at work. So I was, as I was saying earlier, uh, mutations really happen at the, really at the level of DNA. So uh, here in this example, uh, this is ex an example of one type of mutation that can happen in the DNA itself specifically. So, you know, DNA, it's getting copied all the time. It's being used all the time. And as a result of that, it's going to get damaged a lot too. And this is one example, the diagram on the uh, left, don't worry about it too much, but it's just one example of how a um, DNA can go from be reading, a sequence can go from reading uh, TACG to eventually TGCG and ACGC in just one or two generations, really quickly, or of replication of the DNA. Um, so when these mutations accrue in the DNA, 
they end up really impacting the proteins that the DNA is representing. So when we look at, okay, so, you know, we see that, you know, mutations happen in the DNA and they can cause changes in the protein. And we've also talked about how proteins have these very specific structures, right, that are really dependent on their sequences. So you might be like, wait a minute, why wouldn't proteins just stop working if the sequence mutates? And the answer is, you know, you're pretty much right. You know, if some parts of proteins mutate, there's certain parts of proteins that if they mutate, the protein won't work anymore. And then if that protein doesn't work anymore, the organism won't be able to survive. And then those mutations die out. These would be called conserved regions because these regions are really important to the protein's function. And if there is a mutation in that region for that protein, then that organism will not be able to survive. However, there's other regions, non-conserved regions, and this has to do with what Sarah brought up as well, of like those disordered parts of proteins or the parts of the proteins that matter less, um, or even the, you know, the picture of the protein evolution, how like some of those pro parts of the proteins were able to you know, change, but the organism survived. These areas are less important to the direct function of a protein and allow the protein to mutate with, and could potentially make it better or worse, but they won't kill the organism. You know, they'll still be able to survive those mutants. And here we have an example of uh, a histone protein, and we're looking at residues, which again just means amino acids. We're looking at amino acids 120 to 180, and we see that there's a couple of chunks that are conservative, right? Um, we see, for example, uh, that a lot of the sequence matches up pretty well, but then there's some parts that are uh, significantly different, um, where different amino acids uh, have been substituted for each other. And again, it's on the level of proteins and their expression that the big differences we see between organisms happen, right? So between like the human and the chimp, for example, it's completely identical, uh, these two sections, but between uh, human chimps versus mice, rats, and cows, we see that there's a couple areas where they're different. Um, and so that's like another example of uh, how there can be, proteins can evolve and how mutations can happen uh, with mutations generally not happening in conserved regions, but lots of mutations happening in non-conserved regions. Okay, so Mahi had a great question. Uh, what determines whether some region is conserved a lot and that's conserved or not? And that's a great question. And that really has to do, again, with the same picture of, uh, or we can go back to the next picture. Yeah. That really has to do with what that protein does specifically. So, for example, let's say you have a protein that uh, is enzymatic, right? So, it, um, it's an enzyme and it helps get a really important reaction going inside the cell, right? That enzyme is going to have a specific part of it that is actually helping that reaction happen, called an active site, where let's say the substrates, the things that are being reacted, bind together. Let's say this enzyme takes hydrogen and oxygen and it makes water, right? Or something, something like that. So that binding site is going to be really important to making sure that that enzyme can do its job. So if there's uh, changes that happen in the binding site, and typically, those changes are going to result in that binding site being able to do its job less effectively. And as a result, uh, if an organism has that change, it's going to have a, it's going to be worse at doing that job and it's just going to be worse at surviving. And so the organisms that have mutations there will not survive and will not pass their genes on, meaning that that area will be highly conserved. Um, so that would be a conserved region. Typically active sites are relatively conserved regions. Other regions, though, like you see that this is a giant enzyme, right? It has a huge chunk of it that isn't really doing much directly. You know, that whole chunk, you know, that can change a good amount without it directly impacting the active site. So that would be a relatively non-conserved region. Um, it really depends on exactly what that protein is, does and what it needs and what uh, amino acids it needs in order to do that thing, whether a region is conserved or not conserved. And one of the things is the reason we use... Uh, sequence alignment tools is because if we don't have good data about exactly what a protein does or how it does it, it can give us some clues about what areas might be important to that protein's function. So for example, let's say I had no idea what this protein looked like, but I looked at a sequence alignment tool. I looked at a bunch of different versions of this protein across a bunch of different organisms, and I realized that all of the proteins that are in this specific region, or all the amino acids that are in this specific region of the protein, that they're always the same, 
then I probably have a really good, I can make a really good guess that that part is really important to helping that protein do its job. So finally, you know, kind of to end off the, slide, the slides a little bit, we talked about uh, how proteins, uh, we talked about how protein, how you get from DNA to proteins. We talked about how proteins fold, and we talked about, you know, the different parts of proteins and how they can impact proteins evolution. So how does that relate to one of the focuses of this program, protein engineering? And the answer is, if you understand a protein's structure, sequence, conserved regions, active sites, and function, then with this information, you can engineer that protein to do all sorts of different things. For example, protein binding, protein activity, heat resistance, drug development, vaccines research, all depend on engineering proteins. If I have a protein and I want to engineer it to bind better, let's say um, I want to make, I want to use an enzyme to do an industrial reaction, right? Let's say there's an enzyme that does this reaction really well. Um, you know, hydrogenases are a good one, right? Like, or something like that, right? And I want to use this industrially. If I can engineer that protein's binding and activity, binding affinity and that activity to be better, then I can potentially use it to be much more efficient in whatever process I'm trying to do. Let's say there's this protein that's really great um, for, I don't know, making cheese. And I want to use it uh, to make cheese in a factory. But let's say the protein does best inside like a really relatively warm, but not too warm, like, you know, biological temperature. Let's say it works at 37 degrees, but I need it to work best at Celsius, but I need it to work at 40 degrees Celsius then that would be an example of where understanding the function of the protein and what the different parts of the protein are, that would allow me to engineer it to you know, do better in that area. Same thing with drug development and vaccines. If I understand the parts of the protein, for example, with coronavirus, if I understand the structure of the coronavirus proteins and the parts that are essential to those proteins, like the spike protein, for example, for it to infect the cell, I can engineer, um, anti I can engineer antibodies and I can also engineer antigens that mimic those things so I can develop things like a new drug treatment or potentially a vaccine treatment. Um, so these are all examples of how protein engineering depends on all the research that we talked about. So at this point, any other questions, things that we should clarify, uh, things that you guys are not sure of? We're going to go do a real quick live demo of like actually using some of the tools that we talked about this past week too. Uh, but I figure this is a good spot to ask for any other questions or clarification. What's an example of a semi-conservative region? Okay. Um, so a semi-conservative region would typically be a area where um, that area is important to protein function, but uh, the needs of different, one example of it, there's a lot of different ways it could look, is if a area is, again, important to a protein function, let's say it's somewhere that's like an active site, for example, um, for like some sort of enzyme, but the exact needs that are required of the different organisms might not be the same. So a, actually, another example of this might be something like uh, hemoglobin, right? So, you know, all mammals um, have uh, hemoglobin, and we all uh, have, hemoglobin is really important for capturing oxygen and delivering it to different parts of our body, right? It, you know, for our blood flow, making sure we stay alive, all that jazz. Well, there's all sorts of different hemoglobins that our body actually produces. Uh, there's a version called fetal hemoglobin, which is only a little bit different in a very specific conserved region of hemoglobin in the human body. Uh, that's only slightly different, yet it's much, much better at capturing oxygen. So that sounds great, right? Like, except you don't actually use fetal hemoglobin through our entire life. As the name suggests, it's only really used uh, very early on when, you know, a woman is pregnant, for example, uh, the fetus will produce uh, fetal hemoglobin. And the reason is because um, as, you know, when you're, when you're pregnant, when a woman is pregnant, uh, the fetus needs to be able to get 
uh, oxygen out of the mother's blood. So it's not able to directly breathe air by itself. It needs to get it from the mother's blood. So its hemoglobin needs to be better at capturing oxygen than its mother's uh, hemoglobin, right? So that way it can get that oxygen and the nutrients it needs uh, to you know, respirate and things like that. As you grow up though, that's not really as much of a concern. And instead, your concern is because you have ready access to oxygen, right? You can just breathe. Uh, that's less of a concern. And instead, you're going to want something that doesn't grab onto oxygen as tightly. So that way, you can have a better internal balance within your body between oxygen and carbon dioxide. So that's an example of a trade-off that can result from a protein being really good at binding. And that's an example of a semi-conservative region because that region, that specific active binding site, is semi-conserved in the sense that there are parts of it that always stay the same. But then there's other parts that are really important to the function of that protein that will change depending on the needs of the organism and the time in which that protein is being used by that organism, if that makes sense. There was another question in the chat. Uh, it's, are primary and secondary structures more common than tertiary and quaternary? So um, every protein, th there is no difference really between like a primary, it's not like one protein is a primary structure and one is a tertiary structure. Every protein has primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. So you have any one protein has all three of those and it, it's more of a the terminology and the vocabulary is more of a way to frame the way that proteins build up from just having like a chain of amino acids that's a primary structure that that is a protein and then the secondary structures start to form with the alpha helices the beta sheets and and other things like that the secondary structures start to form and those secondary structures within within that it's the same chain of amino acids it's just the secondary structure is the way that that chain of amino acids is folding. And the tertiary, stru tertiary structure is describing how the secondary structures are now folding in and interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then quaternary structures are a, a little bit different from that because not every protein is going to belong to a quaternary structure. Because um, quaternary structures, uh, they're collections of different polypeptide chains. Um, so some some polypeptides don't really need to connect to other other polypeptides in order to do their function although many of them do and many of them actually enhance them that way um so an example of like a quaternary structure would be um like like i said the hemoglobin thing that yeah <laughs> uh, Ayush was just talking about is hemoglobin has four different polypeptide genes that come together and form a, qu a quaternary structure in order to do their function on their own, all of these proteins and po uh, polypeptide chains have their own primary, secondary, tertiary structures on their own. They end up coming together to form a quaternary structure. That doesn't happen for every single polypeptide chain, um, but every polypeptide chain has at least a primary, secondary, and tertiary structure that is uniquely theirs. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any other questions about that stuff? So. All right, in that case, I'll do a brief demo of how this stuff can kind of actually apply a little bit. Um, so I know over the past week, we kind of asked you guys to look through uh, different proteins, find different proteins, and do a few you know, searches on them, try and do some alignments, all that stuff, right? So, you know, I'm going to kind of walk through that process to kind of apply some of the information that we've talked about so far. So first, I'm going to kind of, I'm using the fluorescent protein database, and we're just going to be using a protein from this just because it's easy to pull up proteins here. Um, and I'm just going to be using this to kind of illustrate the points of what's conserved, what's not conserved, uh, and how do we actually, you know, put the, these tools to practice. Uh, so to start off, uh, I'm just going to look at, I don't know, and interactive chart. So I'm going to pick a random protein out of these. Let's see. I don't know. I like green. Green's cool. Oh, is that orange? Uh, let's see. Let's see. One more. Okay. M orange. That seems solid. Okay. So I have M orange two right here. I have this protein, and this already gives me some information about the organism and things like that. But let's say instead of that stuff, I just really wanted to know um, this information, right? So this is the sequence 
this is the uh, amino acid sequence for this protein. So one, <clears throat> one thing that we didn't really cover directly uh, that we can cover now here too is you notice that it starts with an M. And that's actually because pretty much every protein sequence or most of them have a start um, amino acid and a start codon and that's methionine. Uh, just a little fact. Um, so I'm gonna copy the sequence and then, uh, you know, next thing I'm gonna do is, let's say I wanna do a search. So I wanna find, I wanna see if there's other sequences that I can kind of compare this to. So I'm gonna to go to dpi.ac.uk and there's just one of uh, many different services like this that exist. I think we pointed you to the, uh, the American one, the NBIH or NCBIH. Uh, it looks like blue, this is slightly more gray. Not much of a difference there outside of that. I'm gonna to go to services. And let's say first, I just wanna do a blast search, right? So I wanna look, and I'm gonna use the protein blast search because I have a protein sequence. And I just wanna see, hey, you know, I'm wondering what other proteins are like this. So now um, I'm specifically gonna search, these are the different databases I can search from. I'm specifically gonna search for the manually annotated section of Uniprot KB. And what Uniprot KB is, is it's a giant database that has a ton of different protein sequences and just a ton of information on proteins. Um, this is just the one that's been like kind of annotated by people, like people have added extra information in, they kind of filled out more info uh, versus something that was like automatically generated. I could also search, for example, let's say I was interested in like patent information or something, or I was interested in like specific species, I could use these databases uh, but let's say I also want to look at patents. I don't know. Um, so I'm going to look at that. I'm going to look at that. And then I'm just going to paste in my sequence. I'm going to use blast. I don't really care about any default settings. I'm just going to submit. Now my job is running. You know, we vibe for a minute. Uh, Blast is a cool program, by the way, that it, you can actually install on your own computer. Uh, I don't know why you would want to, <laughs> but it is a possibility. Um, okay, there we go. It loaded, and it looks like, oh, we have a few different Blast search results. Uh, these are all from the patent office, uh, but it looks like they're fairly similar, right? So one thing I could do, and see another really cool thing is that it already gives me like an alignment option. Um, so this would allow me to do a practice alignment with all of these sequences. So uh, these are all patent office sequences. Let's say I don't really care about most of these. Is there a way to not align all? Oh, I can. Okay, let's say I'm really interested in the like a few of these. Let's say I wanna do a sequence alignment. So sequence alignment, remember, is how we're gonna look for conserved regions and not conserved regions. And all that means is, hey, are these sequences exactly the same or are there places that they're different? So I'm gonna select a few of these. Um, say I'm gonna select this one as well. And let's say, you know, I'm gonna select, I don't know, this one. The, yeah. Uh, I'm going to select these and I'm going to launch the Cluster Omega. And I have a few different sequences. Uh, and I'm going to do an alignment. Also, while that's loading, uh, we can also see like a visual output of the results that does a sequence match and it kind of shows me you know uh what the protein i put in likely does it also oh well i'm not expecting that to happen oh sad looks like something's broken with their functional predictions uh it gives me a result summary gives me a nice um you know explanation of everything um on top of the different tools and stuff. So now uh, my sequence alignment just happened. And now I see that out of all of these, pretty much everything is conserved. Um, this is the picture that we kind of sh showed earlier and I can 
zoom in a little bit. Let's show colors too. So I see that pretty much everything was conserved here. There's a few areas where there's slightly less conservation. So you see, for example, these two sequences uh, are different. They have Ds instead of Ns. Um, but all of these other places are conserved again, except for here, where we have Hs instead of Rs. And if we lick up these codes, we could actually get a lot more information about exactly what these do um, and like why they might be different. Uh, so D, I think, is glut uh, glutamic acid, glutamate, right? And uh, N, is N asparagine? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's been a minute. <laughs> so if we look at glutamic acid and asparagine, Asparagine amino, amino acid. If we look at this one, you know, we see that it looks like this. Uh, or wait, there's a nice chart. So if we look at, uh, I don't know, that's a pretty bad chart. Uh, amino acid chart. Okay. So we had realized that there's a difference where one is uh, glutamine, one's D, and one's N. Or no, aspartic acid, my mm. bad. Okay, so aspartic acid looks like this, and we see that it has a negative charge. And we see that the other one that we saw, asparagine, yeah, actually mm -hmm. does not have a charge there. It just has a, um, a nitrogen uh, group there. So uh, with that, that kind of tells us a, uh, that there's a couple of differences in this uh, amino acid versus what we, uh, versus the other one. And that will likely tell us more about, you know, what might be functionally different. Uh, maybe that additional charge or maybe that difference in these amino acids is going to result in other functional differences between those sequences, right? So that's an example of kind of how you could use these tools to do these sequence alignments and really get a better understanding of, you know, what might be going on. And, you know, we can even create like a phylogenic tree that shows us how these things might be related. We see that uh, this first sequence is pretty far away. The other sequences are somewhat closer. These are the most closely related sequences. Um, we can... Uh, get a separate like uh, description of just like based on uh, the individual sequence data itself. So this is the phylogenetic tree where it tries to assume like evolution. This one is more just like, okay, these are the most exactly specific uh, differences. These are the further differences, etc. And uh, we can get like a general summary of results as well. And that's all from just this protein uh, data itself. Um, hmm. I'm trying to, I'm wondering if this has a PDB that is attached to it. Entry. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a molecule of one, sorry. Okay. So now if I search for M orange. M orange. Let's try M orange. I see that there actually are structures available for M orange, which is the, uh, or this is the specific one we have, I think. Uh, do we have M orange 2? Let's see if we have M orange 2. Okay, so they don't have M orange too, but they do have M orange. Here we go. So now I have structure, I have structural information. I have information about the protein's uh, spectral properties. I have information here about how the protein and how it connects to other closely related protein sequences. Um, and I know the specific areas where it's different. And I can find them in the structure. I can, or not in the structure, I can find them in both the sequence as well as I can find them in the, um, 
physically based on uh, where it probably is in the 3D uh, structure. I think this will allow me to, yeah, so I could, you know, I can zoom in and I can figure out, okay, this is the specific amino acid that is going to be different. And I can understand where exactly it is and what it looks like. That's kind of the workflow that you can get, again, to understand a lot of these really basic, really cool and, you know, pieces of information and see here, give me the specific amino acid and what number it has. Uh, they're just numbered uh, so to make it easier to access. Um, but yeah, I get all of this information just from a very few quick, you know, clicks and searches. And now from all of this information, I can probably make some pretty good guesses about how M uh, M Orange works and what the important amino acids are to it working. Yep. Any questions on that process or anything I did that was not clear? And I encourage everyone to just kind of try those tools out and actually put some of that stuff we were talking about, about like the differences between proteins and how amino acids can really impact uh, folding and stuff uh, to use. Like I, you know, I, I think the best way to learn is kind of by just looking through those things. The RCSB site. So RCSB site is a database um, that holds a ton of the structures, the solved structures for proteins. So there's a few different ways. We said that it's really hard to hard to tell what a protein will fold up to look like, but there are a few ways you can figure out what the end product looks like uh, using a process called X-ray um, crystallography. And the RSCB site holds a bunch of structures that have been solved that people like, you know, know exactly what uh, the final protein looks like through that uh, website. When searching for patents, should we only serve it through the US database? Uh, Sarah? Uh, no, you should you should definitely look across other databases as well because a patent international patents do apply to like everyone's intellectual property. Um, so yeah, don't just use the U.S. database. Yeah, U.S. database is a good start though. Yeah. If you're just kind of struggling to figure out where to start looking. Any other questions? Things that aren't clear? Things that you want to know more about that was not covered? How do we know which structures to choose to align for clustal lega? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that also really depends on the purpose. So for example, um, let's say I'm trying to investigate uh, the differences. Let's say I'm trying, let's say I have a protein and I don't understand, I don't know the structure of that protein, right? And my goal is to better understand what the structure of that protein might be. Let's say there's a protein that does have a solved structure uh, one way I could get a better understanding of my protein structure is by look, doing a sequence alignment against the solved protein structure. Uh, so aligning, checking my sequence with the solved sequence, and then figuring out what residues are different and where they go on that protein. That might help me get better, a better understanding of what's different. Another example might be, you know, more closely related to patents and things like that. Um, let's say I have a protein sequence that I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, that I'm interested in investigating, right? And I want to check what, whether it's been patented or what the patents are. I run it through the database and check all of the different patents, you know, everything that comes up when I search. And then I would do a cluster alignment to see which ones of those sequences are similar, like uh, really similar enough. And then that would be a good start for me to figure out which patents might apply to that specific protein. Um, if I want to understand evolutionary stuff, <clears throat> I would probably want to choose a lot of different organisms to get a better sense of how that protein has evolved over time. And if I just want to know functionality stuff, uh, I'd probably choose proteins that are, um, you know, uh, uh, proteins that match relatively closely but have known function. 
this is also something that lit review will help too, right? Like let's say you find a protein and you're not sure where to start. The best way to start is to kind of look at what other people have done with that protein. Because typically, you know, as people just like, you know, typically when someone discovers a new protein or they characterize a new protein, they'll do a, some preliminary uh, clustal searches and things like that just to figure out what it might be doing. And if you're interested in learning more about how the structure of proteins is actually discovered and found out and how those models that Ayush was working with earlier is found, there's a video on our channel um, where Alan talks about X-ray crystallography and PIMOL and he goes through the process of how are, how are proteins actually characterized. This is a very complicated process and it's something that's really cool. So if you're interested in learning more about that, um, you could find that in the, on the channel. Uh, charges and polarity definitely impact how the protein will fold in shape. Uh, there's the basic rules that we all kind of, you know, roughly know, right? Like, you know, positive charges attack, attract negative charges. Uh, two positive charges will not want to be near each other. If two molecules are heavily polar, uh, the positive ends of those molecules are not going to want to be near each other. The negative ends of those molecules, if they're both negative, will not want to be near each other. You know, all that sort of stuff still applies. Along with the hydrophilic hydrophobic stuff, hydrophilic parts of proteins want to be near other hydrophilic parts of proteins or near water. Hydrophobic parts want to be near other hydrophobic parts and away from water. Um, the extra layer of like uh, complicatedness you can also add with uh, acid based chemistry. So, a lot of biology relies very heavily on acid based chemistry sort of stuff. And charges and polarity really can impact acid-based chemistry. So that's like an area, if you guys are more interested in, you can you know, reach out to us and we can uh, point you in the right direction. But there's a lot of really cool chemistry stuff that will impact specific folds of proteins and things like that. It's just in general, there isn't like one good way that scientists have found out yet to figure out what that lowest energy state for a protein will be and how it's going to fold there. There are a lot more factors too than just like charges and polarity and hydrophobicness and like hydrophilic things. There's like a lot more um, lesser interactions or things that are less well understood. Those three are the primary ones that um, I, I would say are like most characterized in like how well we understand how they cause proteins to fold. And, but like yeah. it's a very complicated process that we still, like I used to say earlier, we still don't really understand completely how things fold. Yeah. I'd say a few other things are there's some uh, Van der Waals interactions which are when there's large chunks of proteins that aren't charged in any particular way, but they can still have really complex interactions. There's also um, another thing is there's sulfide bridging. So sometimes different parts, uh, different amino acids can actually form um, covalent bonds with each other if they have these things called uh, sulfide bridges. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a bunch of other smaller things like that that can really change how protein there's hydrogen bond networks. Uh, the list kind of goes on and on uh, with like different ways that you know proteins will fold, and it's really hard to kind of calculate out how each one of those amino acids, because each amino acid is going to contribute to the interactions that end up causing the whole amino acid to fold into the right shape. So it's, you know when you have a couple hundred amino acids, it gets very hard to figure out how all of those things are going to you know end up working together to get that final protein. Any other questions?